My background is that I'm a retired clinical health psychologist. I worked in the health service for the England and in Scotland for some 25 years. I'm actually retired for a while now. I retired in 2010, but I've retained my interest in psychology and remained involved in psychology in various ways. And particularly, I've been very interested in, in mental health and, and keeping up with some of the things you know, happening in mental health. Uh, and that's the kind of background to why I'm here tonight. And what I'm going to be talking about is, are we all going mad? Uh, and it's quite a timely talk in some ways, because I don't know whether you're aware or not, but this is Mental Health Awareness Week, which happens every year. Uh, actually, the main focus of Mental Health Awareness this, this year, I think, is anxiety, but I'm going to be talking about a variety of different things. But the lady in the front here asked me, why did I ask you choose the time for, are we all going mad? And I said, well, I'll explain a little bit when I open up my talk. And the answer is that last year, I was getting quite startled by some of the statistics that were appearing in lots of places, saying things like, one in four people will be diagnosed with a mental health problem in a year, that one in six people are prescribed antidepressants in a year. So that's something like 8.3 million people in England, something like 0.9 million people in Scotland. And that it's going up, that in 2021, there was half a million more prescriptions for antidepressants than there had been in, in 2020. And I was thinking, gosh, that, that's quite startling. And particularly the first one worried me, because I was thinking, if I go out with three friends and they all seem reasonably <laughs> OK, does that mean I'm the one with the mental health problem? <laughs> well, actually, my wife would probably agree with that. That's another story. So the first question asked was, well, where are these kinds of statistics coming from? How do we know that? And in fact, there's a variety of places. Some of them are, are Scottish, some of them are more global. But there's a thing that's carried out every year called the Scottish Health Survey. Now, I don't know whether any of you have ever encountered that. But what they do for the Scottish Health Survey is that they take a random selection of the Scottish population and they ask them about physical and mental health issues. And it just so happened that last year I was one of those contacted. It used to be done face to face, but during the pandemic it's been done by telephone. So I got this telephone call and said, would you mind answering some questions? And it produces a lot of this information which backs up these kind of statistics, talking about the increase in mental health prescription issues. But it's not just Scotland and it's not just the UK. That in fact, the World Health Report here is saying very much the same thing on the world scale. It's talking about the very rapid increase that we're seeing in the diagnosis and medical treatment of mental health issues. And there are other things as well that I was looking at. One of them was looking at the range of medicines that are used in mental health. And again, this is a report published in Scotland looking at the prescriptions that are issued. And Scotland has a mental health strategy. And the current strategy runs from 2017 to 2027. So there are all these sources that were backing up these kind of rather shocking statistics that I was seeing. And I thought, gosh, what does that mean? You know, are we all going downhill somewhere here? Are we all going mad in some way? Well, I want to look a little bit more particularly at the medicines issue, because that was the one that really struck me, the prescription of antidepressants, for example. Uh, and this is a graph showing the numbers of, of uh, prescriptions that are issued for, for patients relating to mental health. And there are some things here that are interesting to look at. I mean, one is, first of all, that there are two groups that are far above everything else. The top one there is the prescription of antidepressants. And then the middle one there is the prescription of anxiolytic drugs. And they are far higher in terms of the number of people being prescribed these than all the other groups. The other groups down here include things like antipsychotics, dementia, and ADHD. But this, this struck me as really quite shocking that you know, there was such a huge level of prescription for these things above everything else. And there's a kind of story that follows from that that I was interested in. This is looking particularly at the anxiolytic drugs. They are commonly known as the benzodiazepine drugs. They're prescribed for things like anxiety, things like stress, things like poor sleep, etc. 
Uh, and they've been around quite a long time. They were first prescribed in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, before these drugs came along, what was largely being prescribed was this red line that you can see at the bottom here that's now practically zero, and that's barbiturate drugs. And it was recognized that barbiturate drugs were not very safe drugs. They were actually quite addictive. They had quite a lot of nasty side effects, and there were real problems about getting people off them again once they'd been prescribed them. But these benzodiazepine drugs, and some of the common names are things like diazepam or valium, lorazepam or ativan, mazepam, restoril, came along and people said, oh, wonderful, these new drugs are going to cure everything because they're safe drugs. They're not going to be addictive, they're not going to have side effects, uh, and they're not going to be any withdrawal problems. And they were handed out like sweeties in the 1980s and the early 1990s. They were the cure for everything. They were going to be the answer to everybody's problem. And then suddenly in the mid-1990s and the early 2000s, people said, hang on a minute, actually they're not so safe. They seem to be highly addictive, and in fact, diazepam is now recognized as a street drug, that they actually have quite substantial side effects, and it's absolute hell getting people back off them again. Uh, and what we're seeing here is partly a reaction to that, and that's why I was saying there's an interesting story here, because they're one of the drugs that has kind of flat lined, and the reason for that is that the word went out, be very cautious about prescribing these drugs for new patients, because of what had been discovered and the anxiety about these negative effects. And what we're actually seeing here is a lot of people who are on legacy prescriptions of the drugs. They were prescribed initially in the 1990s or the early 2000s and they never got off them. And we are beginning to see a slight drop now, and that's simply because as time has passed, if you're not constantly adding to the new prescriptions of these, then gradually we begin to see them falling off. But they're the only drug that is actually now falling off in that respect. But the interesting question then arose, well, if you're not going to give people benzodiazepines, what do you do? Well, fortunately, in 1995, another magic drug came along, and that was SSRI antidepressants. Uh, and this is what we're seeing here, that the number of antidepressants, this is looking at the last decade, basically, the prescription, oops, hang on, the prescription for antidepressants has gone up extremely markedly, we have very high numbers of people, say one in six people on antidepressants, but it was okay because these were going to be the new wonder drug that were going to be safe, they're not going to be addictive, they don't produce side effects, no problems with withdrawal, except that, once again, get into the early 2000s and you begin to find that actually problems are emerging. Uh, and as early as, as the, the sort of mid-2000s, 2005, 2006, people were beginning to become very concerned about the rate at which these drugs were being prescribed and used. And in fact, so much so that, well, hang on. Uh, I'll just stick here. Yeah, that's the antidepressants. So much so that in 2006, the Scottish government set a target. And they said, we're worried about this, so what we're going to try and do is to make sure that by the year 2009, 2010, there is no longer an increase in the prescription for antidepressants. Well, as we were just seeing there, that hasn't exactly worked. In fact, it's got considerably worse, and it's causing more and more anxiety. So, they filled on that. Looking just briefly at some of the other drugs, the, the antipsychotic drugs are not actually rising at the same rate as everything else. And that's partly because they're known to be unsafe drugs. They've always been known to be unsafe drugs. They've been known to be potentially highly addictive. They've been known to cause quite nasty side effects. Uh, and again, you have the withdrawal problem. So in fact, there's been a fair degree of caution about these, which hasn't applied to things like benzodiazepines in the past. It hasn't applied to the the antidepressant drugs. But the last group is interesting, and that is drugs being prescribed for ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Now, they actually are currently still being prescribed at a relatively low level, but what's worrying people is what we're seeing at the end of the graph here, 
that in the last few years, they've suddenly started to increase. And the question has been, why? And it's sometimes talked about as the TikTok effect, because on social media, on things like TikTok, you have a lot of influencers who are saying, if you have any problems in your life, it's because you have ADHD and you should be diagnosed with ADHD and you should be put on the drugs, drugs like Ritalin. Uh, and this is driving a trend which is actually encouraging people to seek out being diagnosed with ADHD and to seek out medication. Now, it's quite interesting because if you go back to about 1995, when things like Ritalin were first introduced, the, the diagnosis of ADHD was very rare. And in fact, it was almost entirely applied to school-aged children. Uh, and one of the concerns, even at that time, was it was a very vague diagnosis. And there was concern that actually maybe what it was doing was reflecting parenting problems or educational problems rather than actual psychiatric problems in children. And to some extent, that's still true. We still see that the biggest bulk of, of prescriptions there are for children in the school age range, sort of 5 to 15, 19 age range. But what we're also seeing is shift up here of more and more older adults suddenly wanting to get diagnosed with ADHD and get prescriptions. And again, bringing it right up to date, there was a very interesting panorama program which went out on Monday. I don't know if any of you actually saw it, but what they were doing was looking at the number of private clinics that for 800 to 1,000 pounds will give you a very short chat on the internet and happily diagnose you with ADHD and prescribe you with a drug. And so there's a real concern that, you know, we're maybe seeing the beginning again of what we saw with the benzodiazepines and what we saw with the SSRI antidepressants, that this could again take off uh, and it becomes a cult or, you know, a trend and people are simply going along with that. So there's quite a lot there in the medication detail, uh, data which is quite concerning about where we're going and uh, what the, the consequences of that actually are. Now, it's been said to me, you're a psychologist, you're going to be anti-medication anyway, aren't you? Because you know, psychologists are not psychiatrists. We have the opposite count in some respects. But actually, I'm not anti-medication. And the reason for that is quite interesting because in 1968, I had just left school and I was waiting to go to university and I took a job as a nursing assistant at Leverndale Psychiatric Hospital in Glasgow, which is on the south side of Glasgow. Uh, and I was working on the acute wards there. It was an astonishing experience, which is with me till today. Because in those days, in 1968, a lot of these drugs weren't around. I mean, I've just been talking about them being the 1980s, 1990s, etc. Some of them a little bit earlier than that. Major psychiatric drugs were only just beginning to be introduced in 1968, and they weren't in common use. And one of the results of that was that Leverdale Hospital was literally a madhouse. That if you were working on the acute ward, there were really bizarre things going on. Patients with really bizarre psychotic symptoms, hallucinations, delusions, sometimes self-harming, sometimes being aggressive. You had patients with what was known as DTs, which was alcohol damage to the brain, who were also hallucinating, climbing the walls to try and catch butterflies that they thought were climbing up the walls. You had people who were so depressed, they were comatose, couldn't dress themselves, they couldn't eat, they couldn't talk sometimes. <laughs> and the main task in the ward and the, the acute wards was actually just managing patients' behaviour because it was so so bizarre, so ridiculous, uh, sometimes quite threatening. And, and some of the, the methods that were used for that, uh, they still had straight jackets in 1968. They still had padded cells in 1968, and they were introducing things like ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, was quite widely beginning to be used in 1968. So, an 18-year-old lad seeing all this, I mean, it had a major effect on one of the things that interests me in psychology and led me on to my career later on, and, and in fact, in that career, 
Seven years later, I was down in Liverpool, uh, and I was starting working on my postgraduate course there, and I was working in Green Hill Hospital, which is just outside Liverpool, in St Helens. I walked into the hospital, and I thought, it's not bad. What, what's happened? It was much quieter. Things were much calmer. That in fact, it was no longer just about managing patients' behaviour. People were actually talking about therapy and treatment and how do you help people. And so a lot of the things that I had seen in Glasgow had disappeared. So padded cells were not there anymore. Straight jackets were not there anymore. And ECT, well, it's never entirely disappeared, but it was certainly fading. It was being used a lot less. And people were much less concerned about managing bizarre behaviours, they were concerned about how do we actually treat patients. And I thought, that's a major change. Uh, and I could see the point of medication. It was stabilising people to the point where you could actually work with them constructively, which had not been possible in Levendale. So we look at some of the categorizations that there are for, for mental health problems. And the people I had been seeing in Levendale, and to some extent people I was seeing in Wayne Hill, came under the category of severe mental illness. And I think you know, there's an awful lot we still don't know about these really severe mental illnesses. We don't fully understand them. And I think that people who are suffering from these kinds of things need all the help they can get. And I could see that medication was at least beneficial to some extent for these people. So that's why I'm not particularly anti-medication. But my main talk tonight is not really going to be about them. It's going to be about looking at some of the other things that have been going on. Because the other categorizations were things like moderate mental illness, mild mental illness, and being very unhappy or anxious, which was sometimes described as the worried well. And the interesting thing about most of these groups was that they weren't necessarily seeing psychiatry in the first instance. They were actually being treated in primary care. So the people that they were first seeing and would be making the first prescriptions for them were actually very often GPs rather than psychiatrists. Uh, and it's that group, largely seen initially in primary care, that has produced this massive rise in prescriptions and this massive rise in, in diagnosis of mental health. Uh, and so it's, it's these groups that are actually more scary to me when I'm looking at are we all going mad. Well, last year there were three things that happened that particularly drew my attention. One of them was the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, who are known as NICE, decided that they wanted to have a review of the use of antidepressant medication, and they were doing that on the basis that you know, they, amongst others, were extremely worried about the growth rate of these prescriptions and the growth rate of diagnosis for, for depression. The second thing was that there was a very interesting study that came out which produced a bit of a bombshell looking at the effectiveness uh, uh, and the, the basis for the, the theory of the antidepressants. And the third one was that Scotland, as I say, has this strategy from uh, 2017 to 2027, but they decided that they would have a halfway review, and they had a major consultation last year about the whole approach of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Health Service to mental health. And that was interesting for me because I actually got involved in that, that I was involved from a professional end, I was part of the group who was giving evidence from the British Psychological Society, but also I volunteered to be on the public uh, discussions that, that were going on the public open debates, and, and that was really quite fascinating to me. But we start off with the uh, nice, what they were saying, the reason that why they wanted to have this review about the use of antidepressants. They were saying, actually, when you look at it, maybe medical diagnosis isn't the whole answer here. Maybe we're looking at some of the wrong things. Maybe what we actually need to do is to understand more about the causes of the mental health issues rather than simply trying to treat the symptoms in a medical model. They're saying, what's more, maybe there are better or different ways to treat rather than simply prescribing more and more antidepressants. And they're saying part of the reason for being worried about it is that medication itself sometimes can be the problem, that it's causing these side effects and it's causing withdrawal problems. So maybe we need to have a, another look at this 
think again about what we're actually doing in this field. Uh, and in the course of the discussion that they were having, there was lots of interesting views being expressed about how we should perhaps be looking at this differently. And people were asking questions like, well, what's mental well-being anyway? How do you know whether people are mentally well or not? But what is mental distress? When does that become a mental disorder? What's normal? You know, are some of these things actually normal behaviours? What are the causes behind them? What requires treatment? What requires medication? Or are there indeed different approaches that we should be looking at? And these were all the kinds of things that were coming out when the, the uh, NICE study was taking place, looking at the draft guidelines that they produced and suggesting that maybe we needed a different approach. So one of the questions is, what is well-being? How do you know if people are okay? And in fact, as part of the Scottish Health Survey that I referred to earlier, there's a number of measures that take place each year. One of them is a thing called the Warwick Denver Mental Wellbeing <coughs> Scale. It was first tested as a trial in 2006, but since 2008, it has been a feature every year in the health survey. And what's interesting about that is that despite all this concern about growing mental health issues and mental health problems, when you actually look at it, over all these years, the mental well-being scale has been saying, actually, everything's pretty much the same. And in fact, the only serious deficit you get was actually in 2021. And of course, that coincides with the pandemic. But up until then, by and large, despite all this huge increase in prescriptions, this huge increase in diagnosed mental health issues, the evidence was that people were basically doing reasonably okay. Uh, and in fact, when the Scottish Government had done its initial study in 2006, the average for uh, the, the uh, uh, Warwick Mental Wellbeing Test was a score of 51, and they said, but we are going to sort it, we're going to make everybody even better. But in fact, if we actually look back here, we see that the average over all these years is actually slightly less, it's been about 50. So, <laughs> Scottish government's efforts to suddenly improve all of that didn't exactly work out terribly well. But anyway, second measure that they use in, in the annual survey is GHQ12, which is a test that attempts to measure whether people are showing symptoms that might be considered as symptoms of mental health disorder. Uh, and the idea is anybody who scores more than 4 out of 12 on this test is potentially showing mental health issues. And this test goes back to 2003 uh, in terms of the regular use. But again, what we're seeing here is that, on the whole, all these years through here, it hasn't changed very much. There was a kind of blip in 2018. But the only real increase in the GHQ scores was, again, coinciding with the pandemic. Up until then, by and large, people were not showing that there was a huge growing area of mental health problems. The other thing that's asked every year is people's life satisfaction. How satisfied are you with life? And lo and behold, again, what we see is that from 2012, the last decade, people have scored pretty much the same all the time. Again, a slight drop with the pandemic in 2022. But until then, the average kind of score that people were coming up with across all these years was about 7.5 out of 10. So, where was all this mental health problem, all these mental health issues that these drugs were suddenly supposed to be treating? The evidence was that there was nothing showing that people's mental health in general was getting worse during all these time periods. Well, one of the things that's been driving it is the urge to, to look at medical diagnosis. Now, there's a couple of main manuals are used to actually define mental health problems. This one is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, DSM. It's one that was developed initially by the American Psychiatric Association, and it's the one that tends to get a lot of publicity and has been quite controversial. But the interesting thing about it is if you look at from when it was introduced in 1952, to the latest edition, which is 2013, we see quite substantial changes. 
It was 130 pages long in 1952, and it's now 992 pages long. And the rationale behind it is quite interesting as well. The very first edition was produced because psychiatrists in America couldn't agree about diagnosis. They couldn't produce consistent diagnosis, consistent symptoms that were linked to diagnosis, consistent categorizations of diagnosis. They said, that doesn't look good. Maybe we should sit down and we should agree something in common here. And they produced the first edition of DSM basically as a way of, of showing that there was indeed potential for some consistency in the way in which mental health diagnoses were being made. But as I'm saying, it has grown enormously, it's grown hugely, and it's grown in two ways. One is that they've identified more and more things that are going to count as mental disorder, and the other one is that they've declared more and more things as being symptoms of mental disorder so that you can diagnose more people. And there's some interesting things about that that I want to draw attention to. This first one is one that has personal relevance for me. In DSM-4, the one that was before 2013 model, they said if somebody's had a bereavement in the family and they're showing signs of depression, that's normal. Why wouldn't you show signs of depression? In the 2013 one, they're saying, no, no, no doesn't really matter whether they've had a bereavement or not, we're not going to take that into account at all. If they're showing symptoms of depression and the press, end of the story, treat them. And the reason it has personal relevance to me is that my father was nursed by my mother at home for a number of months before he died. Uh, she was a nurse, so she was able to look after him at home. And when he died, the GP came round to see my mother and he said, oh, uh, I'm going to prescribe an antidepressant for you because you're obviously going to be very upset. To which my mother said, of course I'm bloody upset. What do you expect? And she's basically saying, well, that's a natural reaction. You know, that's not a sign that I'm actually suffering a mental health problem. That's a natural reaction to the circumstances. But as well as sort of easing the criteria for diagnosing people, they also came up with some interesting other diagnoses, things like premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So if a woman is finding that she has mood changes before her period, <laughs> that's potentially a mental illness. I'm sure that's news to some of the women here, but it's not uncommon to have uh, a degree of upset before periods. Internet addiction disorder. People saying, come on, <laughs> yeah. Mild neurocognitive disorder, and that was one that really puzzled people because the, the things that are actually describing that are so vague that nobody entirely knew what it was. It includes things like what's sometimes referred to as mild cognitive impairment, which is the fact that your brain changes as you get older and things like memory may get slightly poorer, concentration may get slightly poorer. So maybe aging is a mental illness. Uh, and people saying, come on, you know. How can you introduce these? The one that's my favourite, though, is this one, Oppositional Defiant Disorder. And this was one to be applied to children. Children who actively defy or refuse to comply with adults' requests or rules. Perform deliberate actions to annoy others. Children who say no to their parents more than once a week for six months. <laughs> You obviously have the same reaction as I have. 99% of all the kids I've known could be dying, including me when I was that age. Yeah, and people say, oh, come on, you know, this is just getting absolutely ridiculous. And there was widespread criticism with DSM-5, when people were saying, there's actually no real scientific evidence behind a lot of this. It's just people anecdotally talking about what they've had experience of as psychiatrists, and then trying to turn that into something that's official. And they were saying, and what's more, a lot of the people who were doing this and who were on the panels doing this were getting paid an awful lot by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and of course, if you have a disease that you can actually diagnose and prescribe something for, pharmaceutical companies are laughing all the way to the bank because it's, it's making them a fortune. So there was major criticism about this. Uh, and in fact, the British Psychological Society at the time was pointing out what they saw as some of the problems, that it was lowering the diagnostic thresholds for a lot of problems, so it was easier to diagnose people as being mentally ill. But medical explanations were being applied to what were actually normal experiences, 
that the, that was leading to the uh, use of unnecessary medications, but it could often be quite harmful. And they were saying, you, what they're saying is basically that we should see the whole of life as a medical problem, and we should see it all in biological terms. And that's basically missing the point. There's an awful lot more to life than that. The other main uh, manual that's used is a thing called ICD-10, which is actually the official worldwide manual. It's the International Classification of Diseases. It's the one that is put out by the World Health Organization. Uh, it covers physical illnesses as well as mental health problems, but it has a whole section on, on mental health. Uh, and again, what we've seen with ICD generally is that it has grown and grown over the years, changed between uh, issue 10 and issue 11 was issue 11 was five times bigger than issue 10. That wasn't just the mental health area, but it was reflected in the mental health area too. Now, to give them a little bit of due, they did suggest in ICD 11 that perhaps we should start thinking about some of the issues around mental health a little bit differently, and they were suggesting maybe we need to start thinking about different kinds of classification systems. But there was still a strong drive for it to be consistent with DSM. Uh, because DSM is, is so popular. Uh, and so if you could get diagnosed under DSM, chances are you could get diagnosed under ICD as well. So it's, you know, it, it's a different manual, but it's producing many of the same problems all over again. But one of the questions that came out of that that I was referring to is the question of what is normal anyway? And in fact, things like depression and anxiety can be perfectly normal. I mean, that was my mother's situation. She was depressed for an obvious reason. My father had died. But there are lots of situations where people are reacting to difficult circumstances and they are suffering a degree of upset as a consequence of that. And in fact, I used to say to some of my clients, if you could never actually feel depressed or anxious, then there would be something seriously abnormal about you because some things are depressing, some things are anxiety provoking. I mean, why wouldn't you suffer that? And not only that, but sometimes depression and anxiety can actually be quite positive because what they can be telling you is something needs to change. And the question then is, well, what needs to change and how do I change it? But it's not necessarily a mental health problem. It's not necessarily a mental illness problem. And I always remember the quote from Churchill who said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Uh, you know, the thing is not to get stuck in that low mood state, that you have to do something constructive about it. You know, if you don't keep going, well, you stay in hell. If you keep going, there's another sign you come out of hell. Uh, and that is perhaps what normal is about. It's not about never experiencing any of these things. It's about working out how best to deal with them when they actually occur. And with that in mind, we can look at some of the recent events now, I remarked in, in the earlier bit that some of the changes that were taking place in, in the measures of people's well-being seem to have been affected by the pandemic. And certainly, a big increase in the prescription of antidepressants came in 2021 compared with 2020. What this graph is showing you is the change that occurred with the pandemic and the number of people who were being identified as, as depressed. And you see you've got... 2019 year, and then suddenly coronavirus comes along, and you end up with roughly double the number of people being diagnosed as depressed or anxious. And you think, well, why wouldn't they be? I mean, what were you hearing in 2020? You were hearing about a pandemic nobody really understood. There were lots of deaths. There were lots of people locking up intensive care units. There was complete destruction of life through things like lockdown. I mean, why would people not be reacting to that by feeling more upset generally? But, you know, this was one of the things that then led to this huge increase in the prescription of antidepressants. But, you know, my feeling is these are normal reactions to abnormal circumstances. But the Royal College of Psychiatrists just last year was saying, oh, we've got to be aware of the mental health problems with the cost of living, that people are going to get upset because the cost of living is going to be difficult, it's going to create problems for them, they're going to struggle. And I was thinking, well, yes, fair enough. 
lots of people are going to struggle and they are going to be upset by that and they are going to find some of the things more depressing and greater levels of anxiety. But is that a health problem? Or is that a reasonable reaction to abnormal circumstances? Yes, life has got tougher. What do you expect? People are bound to react to that to some extent. That's actually a normal reaction, not an abnormal reaction at the end of the day. And one of the other big areas is deprivation. And again, the Scottish government take a measure of deprivation every year, looking at what they call multiple deprivation, people that are, are suffering from being deprived in a number of ways. Some of the areas they look at are things like low levels of income, lack of employment, poor health, uh, poor educational achievement, poor housing arrangements, uh, lack of access to social services and social facilities, and things like living in areas of high crime. And for a long time it's been known that people in deprived areas tend to show higher levels of mental health upset in a variety of ways. But again, you have to say, is that actually a health problem? What's really interesting is when you look at the prescription of mental health drugs in relation to deprivation, and it stands out there very markedly that whether you're looking at hypnotics, whether you're looking at antidepressants, antipsychotics, or ADHD drugs, if you're coming from a deprived area, you're almost twice as likely to be diagnosed and prescribed with any of these things. And you think, well, maybe this is not about health, maybe this is not about illness, maybe this is about deprivation. And in fact, what's quite interesting is that the, there is one drug which is, shows a different pattern, and that is drugs for dementia, and that looks a little bit more egalitarian, and in fact the deprived areas are showing a lower level of prescription, and you think, oh, that's interesting, and then you realise, well, of course, one of the reasons for that is if you live in a deprived area, the chances are you're going to die 10 to 20 years earlier than who are living in a non deprived area. So maybe this isn't really very good news at all. Maybe what it's showing you is that people from deprived areas are dying before they're reaching the point of, of actually being diagnosed to some extent with dementia. But all the other drugs, absolutely clear. If you come from a deprived area, you are twice as likely to be diagnosed and get prescribed than if you come from a, an area that's not deprived. So again, all these are non-medical explanations, if you like, that might explain why people struggle at times. And the question is, is that an illness? Is that a disease? Or is that a fairly reasonable reaction to, to the circumstances they find themselves in? And as far back as 2007, the Scottish uh, Health Department were having a look at some of this. They were saying, why are we seeing this massive increase in prescriptions of these kinds of drugs. And so part of it may be good. Maybe we're alerting people more to the fact that there are actually mental health issues and that may be a good thing. But they're saying, as I've just been saying, that, that, that perhaps some of the causes of that were actually non-medical causes, things like social deprivation and the breakdown of traditional social structures and supports and community, breakdown of family life, etc. They also noted that one of the things was that there was this perceived safety about the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that had been encouraging people. This was the new wonder drug I was saying earlier that was going to cure everything and not going to show up any problems until it started to do just that. And in fact, 2007 was around the time when they started being concerned about it. And they were saying, actually, some of this medicalization is being driven by drug companies. They have an interest in selling the drugs, so they want you to think medically, they want you to think in these terms. And the other thing they were saying is part of it was simply about stress on the NHS. That if you went to see a GP in 2007, you probably had five to ten minutes of a consultation. Nowadays, you're lucky to see a GP at all, what's been happening more recently. But even then, in 2007, you got to see the GP for about ten minutes, and the GP wanted to do something for you in that time. Uh, you know, they couldn't solve all your problems. What could they do? Well, they could send you out the door with a prescription uh, and people would say, oh, thank goodness, you know, I've been diagnosed now, I've got this pill, life's going to be better. And this was being said in 2007, 
Uh, and so that was part of what led the, uh, the government at that time to say that they were going to reduce the increase in antidepressants, but failed to do so. But last year, there was something came out that dropped an even bigger bombshell about antidepressants and SSRIs. It was a study that came out led by Joanna Moncrief and her team. She's a person who has quite a long history of looking at diagnosis and prescription in mental health and being quite critical. She's a psychiatrist. But what she was doing was saying, actually, the whole basis for the idea of antidepressants, the SSRIs, doesn't stand up. Now, you have to explain a little bit about what the theory actually is here. The theory was that there is this chemical in the brain called serotonin, uh, and people who don't show enough serotonin in the brain tend to become depressed. That's the theory. And the other interesting aspect of it was that serotonin is actually produced in the brain. So it's produced in one part of the brain, but then it's reabsorbed in another part of the brain. And so somebody had the bright idea, if you could slow down the rate at which it was being reabsorbed, then there would be more serotonin in the brain and people would not be as depressed. Along come these drugs, reuptake inhibitors, it's supposed to slow down the rate of reabsorption, leading to more serotonin in the brain. And bingo, people should be less depressed. And John McCreef and her team looked at 30 odd years of studies that have been carried out on this. And they said, that may be the story that's been sold to the public. If you ask the public, 85 to 90 percent of people have heard that story and think that's what's true. But in fact, there is absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever. That many studies have shown that depression is not necessarily related to the level of serotonin at all. And the second thing, which is even worse in a way, is that a number of studies have shown that SSRI drugs don't necessarily slow the reuptake of serotonin in the brain either. So the drugs are not even doing what it was claimed that they would be doing. Uh, and this came out as a bit of a bombshell last year. And people said, gosh, you know, all these antidepressants being handed out like Smarties. And it turns out there's absolutely zero basis for it at the end of the day. Uh, and in fact, they were saying, you know, the popularity of this theory is one of the things that's led to people seeking prescriptions. Uh, but they were saying, we don't actually know what these drugs are doing at all. We don't know why they're having any effect, if they're having any effect. And we don't really understand that. Now, what was really interesting was the medical establishment's reaction to this. Because you would expect, in a way, the medical establishment would say, you've got it wrong. You've been looking at the wrong things. You've misunderstood the data. Did they say that? No. What the medical establishment said was, well, we've known for years that this wasn't true. <laughs> and I said, well, well, what have you been doing then? They said, well, people seem to like getting a drug and seem to feel a bit better, so we just kept prescribing them anyway. I said, but you've known all this time that this theory was false. It had no real basis. And yet, what we're seeing is more and more prescription, more and more people being conned, if you like into taking these drugs. They're not being given the information that they might need to make an informed decision. And that, that was perhaps even more shocking, the fact that that was the medical establishment reaction. Uh, and they're saying, well, yeah, but some people do seem to get a bit better. But there was another study that came out about the same time, and it says, actually, if you look at people over the length of time that they're taking prescription, there's not actually much difference between people who have been prescribed and people who are not prescribed. So it's, it was, they were looking at health-related quality of life, and they were saying that you know, if you look at people over a two-year period, whether people had a drug or didn't have a drug, it didn't actually make a fat lot of difference. There was often a slight difference at the beginning, and some people were saying, well, that's actually a placebo effect. You, know, you give a person a pill, and they think, oh, I've been given a pill, I've been diagnosed, I ought to feel better, so I do feel better a bit. But then you follow that through, and that kind of dissipates and disappears. And in fact, only about 60% of people even claim that they get any benefit from SSRI antidepressants. We use 40% of people who get nothing much out of it at all, perhaps not even getting the placebo effect. And the other thing that came out of this study was they were saying the number of side effects for people are quite marked, uh, and the withdrawal effects are a major problem in trying to get people back off the drug. It's extremely difficult because the body becomes dependent on it. 
Uh, and if you take it away suddenly, then the body has a reaction to that absence. And that was one of the things that led Paul Crisp, who's the director for the uh, Centre for Guidelines and Nice, to, to decide that perhaps Nice needed to have this review and to think again about what was actually going on in terms of diagnosis and treatment of <coughs> depressions and anxieties. So, what's the plan? Well, as I say, Scotland has a strategy, uh, and the strategy runs from 2017 to 2027, but Last year, Scotland decided to have a review, a halfway review. Uh, and they did that in two ways. One of them was that they actually asked a lot of the professional bodies to uh, provide information about what they thought about the mental health strategy and how well it was or wasn't working. Uh, and I had a small contribution to that through the British Psychological Society. I was on one of the committees. But the other thing they had was a major public consultation where they had online groups meeting to get the views of the general public uh, and various interest groups about what they thought about the mental health strategy. And I also joined up with one of them and, and sat in and listened to some of the things that were being discussed in these groups. And it was really interesting because they were discussing things like what we actually need is more psychological therapies. What we need are better social interventions to deal with depression and anxiety and mental health problems generally. We need more support in the community. We need to look at things like mental health at work. You know, work can be quite stressful and causing mental health problems. We need to look at some of the things that we know are bad for your health, things like alcohol, smoking and drugs, which also cause mental health problems. We need to look at things like promoting people being fitter doing exercise. One of the interesting studies that came out a few years ago showed that if you're feeling depressed, going out and having a run is one and a half times more effective than taking a tablet. So things like exercise and being physically fit are actually good for your mental health as well as your physical health. And I was talking also to these people in the public sessions about promoting healthy diet. They were noting that the effect of junk food, for example, on people's mental health is quite marked. The people who have a very junk food diet tend to also have more mental health issues and mental health problems. The one thing they weren't saying was give us more pills. They were actually identifying a whole range of different things, not the medical model, but looking at different things and saying, these are the things we really ought to be concentrating on. One of the ones that interested me, of course, was psychological therapies. Because that was one of the things that a lot of people talked about and the difficulty of getting psychological therapies. Scottish Health Service has a target that 90% of people should start treatment within 18 weeks. And they're certainly not currently achieving that target. The latest quarter was the quarter ending in December last year, when only 81% of people were actually getting that uh, treatment within 18 weeks. That was uh, slightly uh, worse. Uh, or slightly better rather than the previous quarter ending in September, but was significantly worse again than the corresponding quarter last year of December 21. What these statistics don't actually show, I mean, they're showing that we're not achieving the target, uh, and there's more and more concern about that. And in fact, there's been some investigations recently in NHS Lothian, particularly about child mental health, and we've just come off the at risk level because the, there's various levels you, your uh, health service consider that uh, NHS loading was at level three, which is not doing good enough, and it's now being reduced to level two, it's doing slightly better, but still not meeting the target. Uh, but what the statistics don't show there, but what some of the statistics do, if you look online, it shows that some people in some areas of Scotland were waiting not 18 weeks for treatment, they were waiting 18 months for treatment, uh, and in one or two occasions even longer. So, although psychological therapies was one of the things that the public certainly saw that they wanted more access to, there's certainly a bit of a shortfall there. But one of the other things which is, I think, changing, uh, and which was reflected in the public discussion, was that a lot of people were saying, instead of simply looking at the DSMs and ICDs and medical models and what psychiatrists are saying, why don't you listen to what the people are saying who are actually going through this? who've actually got lived experience of these things. 
uh, and Health and Social Care Alliance in Scotland, along with Box Scotland, produced a major bit of evidence for this review, this, this halfway review, saying exactly that, a lived experience perspective. And again, that's not something that's being said just in Scotland or just in the UK, because we have this paper that's been published by the World Health Organization, which is saying very much the same thing. It's saying maybe we should be listening more to what the people are saying who are actually going through these things and have experience of what it's like and how it affects them. So is that going to actually change things? Are we going to see a change in the way in which we think about mental health? Well, one of the interesting things is to say that the current uh, strategy is supposed to run from 2017 to 2027, but what the Scottish Government is saying as a result of the information they got out of this consultation is they're going to bring that forward. Uh, and they're saying now that they're going to produce a new health and well-being, mental health and well-being strategy in spring this year. Well, we're already getting into summer, so they haven't quite managed spring, but maybe we'll see it sometime soon. But what they've recognised is that the way in which things were being done in the past is perhaps not the best way to be looking at doing things in the future. But what was really interesting is if you have a look at this paper, they, they were listening to people and they were listening to what people were saying about mental health issues. And there's a couple of tables that I want to show you briefly. This is the first one where they said to people, what are the things that have a negative impact on your mental health? And these are the kind of top things that people kept coming back to. Poverty, cost of living, crisis, discrimination, which the interesting one there is that people say one of the things that makes life worse is only being offered medication. But that's not really tackling the problems. Uh, and that, 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 that really doesn't help uh, in a good way all the time at all. So I mean, this was they were saying, look, these are some of the things that you need to be attending to. And a lot of them are not medical. And they're not about illness, they're about life, social life, policies, etc. But the other thing that they asked people was, what actually leads to better mental health? And these are the kinds of things that people were saying they wanted to see change for the better. Having a healthy, balanced life, feeling like you belong to the community, feeling safe, being free from abuse, housing, all these kinds. Again, one thing that's not on there is give us more pills. That was not what people were focusing on. They wanted to see much more fundamental changes in the way in which we were recognizing and dealing with, with mental health issues. So this is two tables from this review, uh, and that hopefully is going to carry forward into the new strategy. We'll have to wait and see when it actually appears. But maybe they are beginning to listen to what people are saying. Maybe they are beginning to hear a little bit more about the lived experience of people. And maybe, maybe if we're lucky, maybe that will begin to change the way in which we move forward in terms of thinking about and dealing with mental health problems. So finally, the kind of questions that have arisen is, you know, have we been in the past in danger of promoting all psychological distress as abnormal and illness, when perhaps it's not always that at all? Is this very often ending up pathologizing normal experiences, uh, taking things that people quite reasonably experience and suddenly saying that's a symptom, bang, mental health, mental illness? Are things like well-being and resilience only issues for the health service? Are the only health issues are they are actually about illness, or should we be looking at other things like education, social facilities, social support? government policies that might have an impact on things like mental health. Maybe that's some of the areas we should be looking at, and not just looking at medication, not just looking at uh, the illness problem. Because, as we've seen, one of the consequences of the medical approach and seeing that as the primary approach has been this vast rise in medication, which is causing problems in itself, uh, and perhaps misdiagnosing and overdiagnosing an awful lot of people. Are there alternatives? Well, people were certainly suggesting that there are, and perhaps, as I say, if we follow through these two tables, that, that might well influence the, the, the next policy from the Scottish Government. There certainly seems to be potentially alternatives. Or, are we all going back to 